What if we could reverse engineer enlightenment? Imagine scientists got really, really good at seeing what the enlightened brain looks like biochemically, and then was able to cr create a big donkey donk machine or the brain gazoogler that fits over your head and shoots in gazonga rays and reproduces biochemically within your mind and brain the exact same experience that the enlightened person has. This question and others like it are at the heart of today's video. But first, a word from our sponsor. Just kidding, I ain't got no sponsor. Let's do this. So about a year, year and a half ago, I got an email from a guy who directed me to a video. The video is like a short nine, 10 minute documentary put out by the Guardian newspaper. It features Shinzen Steve Young, who is an American meditation teacher, uh, absolutely brilliant man, supremely geniusic science wonk, as well as a guy who knows everything about spirituality and different traditions. And he actually translated for my teacher, Joshu Suzaki Roshi, because he speaks like 13 different languages fluently. In this Guardian segment, which is called Hacking Enlightenment, Shinzen Steve Young and a guy named Dr. Jay Sanguinetti, who is like co-director of something called the SEMA Lab in Tucson, Arizona. This video follows these two guys briefly as they attempt to develop technology to help us meditate way better, like exponentially better. The technology that they are experimenting with as a booster shot for your meditation practice is ultrasound technology, ultrasound. How you take pictures of your fetus, for example. Sound waves, basically, that take pictures of what's going on inside of you. To be honest, this video is a little bit short on science and scientific explanations of just exactly how this technology is helping people meditate better. It's short on that and long on pictures of Shinzen Steve Young walking around in slow motion with mystical enlightenment music playing in the background and him being kind of Satori faced. But in any event, in this video, a scientist talks about the posterior cingulate cortex, which is like a, a network of areas in the brain that he says are responsible for a lot of like negativity, nasty self-imaging, unhappiness, anxiety, etc. So when you target this part of the brain with ultrasound technology, you know, cut to the Guardian video with it image of a brain and little waves, ultrasound waves coming and hitting the brain. When you target this posterior cingulate cortex part of the brain with this ultrasound technology, it like temporarily disrupts that area's ability to function. And there's like an opening there. And in that brief opening, a lot of the study subjects describe experiences that, that seem to be remarkably similar to experiences that very deep meditators have when, for example, they, they have a great sit or they have an opening of some kind. Another piece to this video is kind of the medical mental health piece. So this technology is not only billed as, a, as something that can help your meditation practice, it's also framed in the same way that a lot of people are talking about MDMA or psychedelic therapy now. There's a woman who uh, I think she was kind of depressed in this video and she wanted to give the ultrasound a shot. She does it and it really worked for her for the brief amount of time that she did it. Um, she described some of the experiences that she had. She made an interesting point. She said, hey, look, man, a lot of us who are really anxious, 
we don't really want to practice mindfulness meditation. We don't want to sit with ourselves or sit with those thoughts. I mean, her basic premise was, please understand, like that's the problem is once when we've got these eruptions of negative self-imaging and anxiety and oftentimes depression and to sit with this as one is asked to do in mindfulness practice is just too much for us. So her point was technology like this, that could give me a little taste of, of, of what the results of meditation are without having to go through all that horrible, potentially damaging and terrifying work are really welcomed. The video ends on an interesting note with uh, the aforementioned enlightenmenty music playing in the background. Enlightenmenty, I like that. Enlightenment, pop an enlightenment. That'll be the next thing. 40 years from now, it's gonna be like, we're gonna cut to a video of the enlightenment. Anyways. Shinzen says, and I quote at the end of this video, I won't do a Shinzen impersonation, but he's got kind of a funny eggheady voice. This technology scares me. This technology scares me. And a future without this technology scares me a lot more. And then he says, that's why we gotta democratize enlightenment. Now I'd like to return to the question I posed at the beginning of this video, which is the heart of this video, which is something I've been pondering a lot lately with the um, arrival of our artificial intelligence overlords, AKA Bard and ChatGPT. So imagine a world where the scientists get really good at figuring out exactly what is going on physiologically inside of a brain when a person is having a satori and opening and enlightenment experience, etc. Okay? And then they invent the satori helmet. And you put this helmet on and it goes and you have an enlightenment experience. Four hours earlier, you were at Burger King doing your cheeseburger and t texting your dad, hey dude, I'm gonna be a little bit late tonight for the work we're supposed to do because I'm gonna go have an enlightenment experience. You go into the outlet mall, Satori R Us, you sit down, you get the Satori helmet, ding! But is it really an enlightenment experience? Can you have a quote unquote enlightenment experience without any effort of your own? I mean, can you grow the lotus without the mud? What if you negate the whole great determination and great effort part of Zen practice? What if you get rid of the sit like your hair is on fire? Or what if you get rid of what is called in the transmission of the lamp, bone crushing effort? What if you get rid of all of that? What kind of enlightenment is it if, if, if it can be induced by a hack? However, just to play the devil's advocate, I find myself thinking, for example, when I was in high school, I had a pretty profound opening and it set me on my path in life really it's it 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 instigate catalyzed my desire to write which eventually led me to a zen buddhist monastery etc right now that experience dropped on my head out of nowhere it was a gift from it was a gift of grace that just came. It wasn't through my own effort that I had that. However, conversely, I've heard a friend of mine, my Zen friend, talk about how openings are easy. It's not the opening that counts, it's incorporating. Not opening, but incorporating. So it's post-Satori training that really matters and that really ultimately makes you a Zen master, i.e. how you incorporate the insight into your life. So you can't just put on the Satori helmet, have Satori, and now you're a Zen master. That doesn't matter, my friend says. Like, 
everybody has openings. You know, everybody watching this video can specifically rack their brain right now and remember that moment they had when they realized they were one, one with the cosmos. They had that experience of being one, bigger than themselves, part of, and like, like Blake's statement, the whole universe in a grain of rice, the whole universe in you. We've all had experiences like that or similar to that, right? But an argument that's often made in terms of the qualities that are required to be a Zen master is that you have to be able to manifest, manifest that insight and that wisdom in every moment of your life. And that's what makes a Zen master, not a bunch of, you know, interesting fireworks going off in your brain. When it comes to these questions of technology and wisdom and enlightenment and enlightenment experiences, these are like really, really deep, difficult, strange topics and questions. And, and I don't have an answer. You know, something that occurs to me though, I did a video recently, uh, which I would just like to retract. Um, it was, I don't remember exactly what I was talking about, but it was something like, you know, I was, one of these things where I was talking about meditation, right? And I was kind of like trying to talk about a way that I include all of the stuff that's going on inside my head directly into my meditation practice. So I will acknowledge it when I sit. And after I shot the video, I didn't like it. When I was editing, I didn't like it. And later on, when I watched it before I put it up, I flat out hated it. And the other day I was thinking about it again and I hated it even more. And the reason was, it's really simple. It's so simple to meditate. You know, you just sit and it doesn't help anybody if you make it more complicated than that. And it doesn't help anybody if you start promising things. You know, like, like arguably, if you blast your brain with certain scientific devices like a, like a, a, a sonogram or a whatever the hell it was, I forgot now. Um, you, you know, if you put this Satori helmet on, you'll have this great experience. Like. I don't really think that that shit helps at all if you've got that running through your head, or for me anyways, like all these different hacks for meditation, like all these mantras that you can say, or you know, you can take your psilocybin and all the parts of your, different parts of your brain will connect that are not normally connecting, um, or just like, you know, somebody sent me something the other day that was called like extreme or hardcore meditation and it was a way of like just ah, making yourself break through. Like there are all these methods and you know, I do different things when I'm sitting. Sometimes I will try and bring my problems out in front of me and incorporate them into the sit and hold them like I would hold a koan. Other times I will work with a koan and breathe into it and breathe out of it. Sometimes I'll have my notebook there and I'll be sitting and then if I, something comes to me, I'll write it. You know, there's a lot of different things that you can do. There's a lot of different ways that you can practice. There's a lot of different stimulants that you can try, et cetera, et cetera. But in the end, it's really, really simple. You just sit. You sit, you breathe in and you breathe out. And you do that with no expectations. You do that with no thought of the Buddha. You do that with no thought of Shinzen Steve Young and his, and his enlightenment helmet. You just sit and breathe. And the simpler an attitude you have, the more friendly an attitude you have, the less expectations you have, the less fear or desire or hatred or the less of, of anything that you bring to the cushion in terms of what you expect from your meditation practice, the better. You just sit with it, right? So somehow I understand Shinzen's point, right? That, that he fears this technology that he's exploring and helping to explore, but he fears a world without it even more. I understand that point of view. I would also say an enlightened point of view is sitting with it all. 
no matter, no matter what happens, sitting with it all, okay? I mean, what's the koan say? It's like, what is the great meaning of Bodhidharma coming to the West? And the answer is, hey, did you eat your breakfast? You did? Well, then wash your bowls, right? Washing your bowls in the sink. Your stupid lay life with your bowel movements and the pebbles in your sandals and your crow's feet, all of it. Your limited, beautiful, sad, normal human life. That is equal to this grand enlightenment experience. They're a hundred percent equal. Form is emptiness, emptiness is form, nirvana is satori, satori is nirvana. Can a five minute like tsunami rainstorm of gamma rays or enlightenment juju or ultrasound waves pumped into the brain make you realize that? I don't know. I don't know. But that to me is the enlightened mind. It's a, the mind that's, that's totally okay without even being enlightened. It's what Zen Master Rinzai, the founder of my tradition, calls ordinary mind. Ordinary. Ordinary mind is the enlightened mind. If you would like to support my ordinary mind, you can sign up for my Patreon page. There is a link right below here where my finger is pointing and also in the video description, I have blog posts there. I have essays there, long essays, short essays, juicy personal essays. You might enjoy them. You can become a Patreon, patron and support me on Patreon. And... But I offer these videos for free, so... It's like a hundred degrees in this room. And I'm trying to say that I offer these videos for free so you don't gotta support this channel if you don't want to, but you already knew that. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to go completely redo this video with a script from ChatGPT. Excuse me, thank you, good evening, and good night.